Well, hi, everybody. This is Ron Miller. I'd like to welcome you once again to the Bishop's Corner. Greetings in Christ Jesus, folks. I'm here, as always, with Most Reverend Daniel E. Thomas, Bishop of the Diocese of Toledo. And boy, are we glad you're here, yes, right, Ron? As always. And <laughs> folks, the Bishop's Corner is heard every week on Annunciation Radio, as well as Holy Family Radio. You can also access the Bishop's Corner program on Bishop Thomas's Instagram and X feeds. You can listen anytime on demand from the Annunciation Radio app, and you should check out the video podcast of the Bishop's Corner on the Bishop's Facebook page or at our websites, AnnunciationRadio.com and HolyFamilyRadio.fm, and you can submit future questions there. And sometimes people hear that uh, opening, Bishop, and they'll say to me, if they only watch it on video or they only listen on, on radio, the radio. They're, all, they're like, oh, well, I've never seen one or the other or heard one or the other. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I know. Well, some of those radio folks need to know that we're doing this. <laughs> I think they do. You're right. We've been doing video for years now, Ron. <laughs> I know. So how are you? Oh, anyway? great. Thanks be to God. Good to be with you folks. And we're so grateful that you join us for the Bishop's Corner. Yes, we are. And and let's and we have a lot of questions, Bishop. We do. So let's go over your schedule and get to our gospel. Sure. So this will air, friends, on the 15th of August when, of course, we honor Our Lady uh, and we honor the her assumption into heaven, bodily assum assumed into heaven. So this will air on that day. So blessed solemnity to you. Happy feast day. And uh, there are on only a few things, but one of the most significant on the calendar is the blessing I'll have to install our former vocation director, now pastor, and to install him as pastor in his two new parishes. So it'll be a delight to be in... in uh, Pardon me. It'll be a delight to be at St. Michael Church in Kaleida with Father Phil Smith to install him in the parish on Saturday evening and then in Continental at St. John the Baptist Parish on Sunday morning. So whenever I do these installations, Ron, of a pastor who has a twin parish mm -hmm. or twin parishes, sure. I should say. I try to do them both on the same weekend so that we can make sure that no one feels left out. Yeah, but it'll be wonderful to be with all the great people there in Kaleida and in Continental. And, of course, with Father Phil Smith as he's formally taking up his role as pastor there. And then it really it, it pushes forward in many, many ways to the following uh, Thursday. And there's an event that evening, but I think we can announce it next week, Ron. Okay, that's good. Thank you. All thank right. you. Well, thank you. And, and that's the abbreviated version, that folks. That is, I know. <laughs> let's go to a recent gospel from John, the 19th Sunday, Ordinary Time. The Jews murmured about Jesus because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? Do we not know his father and mother? Then how can he say, I've come down from heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, Stop murmuring among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who has sent me draw him, and I will raise him on the last day. It is written in the prophets, They shall all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to my Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Amen, I met, amen, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the desert, but they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. Your thoughts, Bishop? Folks, let's start with that last phrase, because isn't that the very thematic of our entire Eucharistic revival for our nation, for the United States? My flesh for the life of the world. And I don't know if any of you watched it. If you didn't, I would humbly suggest, of course, I was there, so I saw it, it live. But if you didn't watch the National Eucharistic Re Revival Congress that took place just a few weeks ago in July, I would invite you to do so, especially if you like The Chosen and Jonathan Rumi, because Jonathan Rumi spoke at the final revival event on Saturday evening. And in fact, he told us that in order to be a, give a further impact of our belief in the Eucharist, he was going to do basically a dramatic reading in character of the partial piece of this passage which is exactly what he did. It was quite striking. So if you have an opportunity, I would suggest that you go 
and watch that. Why do I say that? And pardon me. <coughs> pardon me, I'm really. <coughs> so why do I say that? Sometimes, you know, we hear the gospel on Sunday, the deacon proclaims it or the priest proclaims it and we hear it. And because we're so familiar with it, maybe it doesn't strike us. But when you listen to Jonathan Rumi, who you've probably watched in The Chosen, when you hear him in character, if you will, of Jesus say it, it perks our ears a little bit. Maybe we listen a little more closely. And people did that evening. The bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. This is the gospel on which turns our belief. And this is the gospel that we quote to say, this is what we believe. Because notice, in this gospel, didn't we hear Jesus say, this bread comes down from heaven so that one may eat it. I am the living bread come down from heaven. He's repeating this again and again. And when things are repeated in scripture, it's to tell us that the emphasis is being made. And in this case, Jesus himself emphasizing, I am the living bread come down from heaven. The bread I give is my flesh. Let's ask for an increase, and you know, you know the phrase from our diocesan Eucharistic Revival Prayer, an increase in a deeper understanding of love for and living out of the Holy Eucharist. All right. Thank you, Bishop. Let's go ahead and get a Can question. we get a question yeah, in, Ron? Absolutely. Wonderful. We're going to start with Amy from Our Lady of Lords. Thank you, Amy, for writing in. Dear Bishop Thomas, uh, what are the guidelines which qualify a hospital to be Catholic? The hospital where I am employed celebrates the beginning of June with a near blasphemous prayer for the LGBTQ community, and now I'm learning they're going to start allowing abortions if they are judged necessary. This seems to be a very slippery slope and is very disheartening. Easter is now considered a floating holiday since not everyone celebrates it. Aren't they required to uphold any Catholic morals? One of the reasons I wanted to work at this hospital is because it is Catholic, but I feel this is more in name than practice. Thanks, Amy. Thank you, Amy. So uh, first, and thank you for writing in from Our Lady of Lords. I guess the f I, I would say a, a number of things about this, which would take a long time, but to try to address the issues that you brought up. So the first question, what makes a Catholic hospital Catholic? And that is, the permission to call themselves Catholic, which is granted by the bishop, and that they are following Catholic teaching, in particular, the Catholic identity, which they are invited to uphold and promote, not only in their place, that is what is seen, but in their practice, that is the wonderful gift of medical practice, which is exercising the healing ministry of Jesus of the Catholic Church. Now, you say here, you mentioned to me, and please know I, I haven't heard any of these things. You talk about you're employed in this hospital. There was a blasphemous prayer for the LGBTQ community. Well, I, first we have to say there is no reason why we shouldn't be praying for people in the LGBTQ community. Certainly we want to play, pray and care for and pastorally be concerned about people who have same-sex attraction and all these other iterations. So I'd be very careful there. I didn't hear the prayer. I don't know what was blasphemous, uh, blasphemous about it, but I think we should say, Amy, that there's no reason why we shouldn't pray for folks, any folks, and we do that regularly as a Catholic community. That's who we are. Now, it also you also then talk about this starting to allow abortions if they're judged necessary. An article was published recently about this specific topic, but I think we have to be very, very careful about it and also to talk about what governs a Catholic hospital. And we know what governs a Catholic hospital are what are popularly called the ERDs. And I don't go for acronyms, as everyone knows, so you should know it's the Ethical and Religious Directives published by the bishops of the United States, which govern the all the actions of the hospital regarding medical practice. So uh, I, I think we have to say also, and I think this is helpful, might be helpful for you to read this article. It's an excerpt from the U.S. Catholic Faith in Real Life in 2015. What makes a Catholic hospital Catholic? I think it's a helpful article to go to. But here's a helpful phrase. 
Although the tangible manifestations of Catholic identity are the subject of much debate, the concept is fairly circumscribed because Catholic identity is an institutional faith in the narrative of God's healing love, and thus the most challenging question for Catholic healthcare today is not so much what Catholic identity is, rather the challenge of contemporary healthcare or is how to cultivate the cultures that make decisions that embody that Catholic identity. And I think it, I, I can share with you that at least one hospital, one Catholic hospital, raised the question and tried to get at the heart of this. And that is, for example, the ethical and religious directives permit operations, treatments, medications that have as their direct purpose the cure of a proportionately grave condition. One of these might be an abortion. But it's very, very careful and very, very nuanced, Amy, where we have to be able to say, no, this is not about performing abortions. We have to say, it has to be very clear, the procedure is for a purpose, which only its secondary effect would be the loss of a child. Catholic moral theology is very careful there. I'm not sure what you read, but that's where we stand, and that's where Catholic hospitals have to stand according to the ethical and religious directives. Okay. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you. Uh, folks, we do have to take just a quick break. Uh, we have a lot of questions to get to here, so stay with us. Don't go away, in other words. We'll be right back. Annunciation Radio is your voice for the Diocese of Toledo. Serving Northwest and North Central Ohio for over 10 years, Annunciation Radio is your home for the Bishop's Corner and other great local shows from our own diocese like Say Yes to Life with Peter Range, Understanding Scripture with Father Dave Nuss, and our live local Catholic morning show, Morning Offering. Listen live on your radio or anytime on demand on the Annunciation Radio app or website. And we're back here, folks, at the Bishop's Corner with Bishop Daniel Thomas. Uh, folks, Great, you're with us, everyone. You can submit those uh, questions you have at uh, the website of the mobile app we gave you earlier. You can also email them directly to bishop at annunciationradio.com. Maybe give us your first name, your parish, the community you're from, something like that, so the bishop has some idea who he's speaking with. We do our very best to get them all on the air, but if you don't hear it on the first show you listen to, keep listening. Bishop, you wanted to uh, clarify something? Yeah, I just want to clarify, just for our folks, is this question about Catholic hospitals and the performance of abortions has been raised with me by a number of folks. I just want to be super clear, those ethical and religious directives they permit operations, treatments, and medications that have as their direct purpose, notice the language, the cure of a proportionately grave condition, even if this may indirectly result in the death of an unborn child. But Catholic moral theology and medical ethics carefully distinguish these interventions from abortions, which directly and intentionally result in the death of a human being in the womb. So notice how careful that language is, folks. And I, I think it's important that, obviously, Catholic hospitals be very objective in recognizing this and clear because people simply need to know that this is who we are and what we do. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Bishop. And let's go to uh, Lynn at Fremont St. Joseph. Dear Thank Mr. you, Lynn, for Thomas, writing in. I belong to Ask a Catholic Priest on Facebook. Uh, some of the answers mention the fourth commandment to honor our father and mother. This includes obeying our mother, Holy Mother Church, and the laws of our government, which I do, but I had never heard this before. I had only learned to honor my parents, who are both gone. Thanks, Bishop. Thanks, Lynn. I was going to say, who was that, Ron? <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah. you, Lynn, so much for writing. And guess what, Lynn? A, I am not, I do not belong to Ask a Catholic Priest on Facebook. Facebook, but B, that's the first time I've heard that interpretation too, Lynn. So how about that? I, I would suggest, Lynn, that you go, where do, what do I always say? Go to the sources. So go to the Catholic Catechism, Part 3, Life in Christ, the Ten Commandments, Chapter 2, You Shall Love Your Neighbor as Yourself, Article 4, the Fourth Commandment, Number 2199 to 2200. So it's very clear the Fourth Commandment is addressed expressly to children in their relationship to their father and mother. The relationship is the most universal. And it says, likewise, concerns the ties of kinship. It extends, listen to this, Lynn, 
it extends catechism to the duties of pupils to teachers, employees to employers, subordinates to leaders, citizens to their country, and those who administer or govern it. This commandment includes and presupposes the duties of parents, instructors, teachers, leaders, magistrates, those who govern, and all who exercise authority over others or over a community of persons, Lynn. Catholic Catechism of the Catholic Church. So it's not something new, obviously, but I personally, I also did not know up front that that interpretation could then say, well, this includes that Holy Mother Church has something to say about the laws of our government. So good for you, Lynn. Thanks for raising it. <laughs> good. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to Barbara, who's uh, from Old St. Pat. Thank you, Barbara. Dear Bishop, should a retired priest who is subbing for the pastor change the normal petition in response to it that the pastor and the parish use? Thanks, Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. So I appreciate your writing in. Uh, what is uh, it's Your question, unfortunately, is unclear to me. You say the priest who is subbing change the normal petition. Well, unfortunately, Barbara, in the Catholic liturgy, there are several petitions all through the sacred texts that are given, which are fixed by the church. So if the petition is the collect or a prayer, then if those are fixed, the pastor or the sub and no other priest can change those. If what you're talking about in your question is the response to the petitions of the universal prayer, then my answer is yes. <laughs> Can the retired priest do it, change it? Guess what? You won't believe it, Barbara. The bishop changes the response every time he goes to celebrate Mass in every church throughout the diocese. Why, Barbara? Because there is no fixed response for the petitions. So everybody, like Pavlov's dogs, does Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray to the Lord, hear our prayer. Is that the fixed petition? In many parishes it is. But Barbara, I change it everywhere I go so that it reflects the liturgy and the readings. So you say here, can somebody do that? And the answer is not only can they, I would recommend that they do it to help our faithful not be like Pavlov's dogs and just hear the very same thing over and over and over again. It sparks an interest and it helps people to listen and pray better, I believe. So I hope that's the right answer, because I'm not sure if you're talking about the petitions in the universal prayer. If it is, that's the case. But here's, here's the real answer. Go to the sources. General Instruction of the Roman Missal, Barbara, number 71. It is for the priest celebrant to regulate the prayer from the chair. He himself begins it with a brief introduction, which he calls upon the faithful to pray, and likewise, he concludes it with an oration. The intentions announced should be sober, composed with a wise liberty and in a few words, and they should be expressive of the prayer of the entire community. So the fundamental simple answer, Barbara, is the priest celebrant is the one who regulates the general, uh, from the general structure of the Roman Missal, the universal prayer and its response. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Bishop. You only give right answers, don't you? No, I often give... <laughs> Opinionated answers. <laughs> All right. We're going to go to Max, Holy Rosary Cathedral. Your Excellency, I wear both my scapular and crucifix. I notice many people at church and people out in the community wearing them on the outside of their shirts or other outer clothes. I have been taught to always have them underneath and not outside. Is there a proper way to wear them inside or outside of a shirt? I also do long distance running a lot as well. And is there a proper way to keep my scapular from blowing all over the place? <laughs> Max, Thanks, that's Max. a question I've never had. I must confess. <laughs> First, Max, God love you. And thank you for wearing a scapular. I think that's wonderful. You probably know that on social media, we've seen recently that there are pretty evident uh, sports figures who will, you know, on social media, they'll catch a glimpse of, you know, the cord of their scapular, a little piece of the scapular peeking up because they're faithful Catholics who wear a scapular. And wow, social media goes wild and Catholic sites go wild over this. And they think it's amazing. And blessed be God. So good for you that you wear a scapular or a crucifix around your neck. There is no law that governs these things, Max. I would simply suggest, and good for you for being a long distance runner, wish I were. I would suggest that if it's bobbing all over the place, 
Here's what my mother would do, Max. Take a little tiny pin and pin it inside your shirt. And that way, it doesn't fly all over the place. And most of all, if you're a runner, you might lose it. I don't want you to lose it and have it fly away. So these are simple realities. We do practical things. There is no law that governs how you can do that. Thank you, Max. All right. Thanks, Max. And one more, Bishop Chris, on social media. Good, Chris. Thank you. I'm confused about communion services. Chris, don't be confused. What exactly are they? And when are they a good option? Thanks, Chris. So thank you, Chris. And this is a very, very good question because we, I think we've had this question before. It's always good to clarify. Yes. huh? So I think you, again, go to the sources. So Chris, I'm suggesting you go, and I'm going to recommend a number of sources here, so listen carefully. I think the first source, of course, is the, the, uh, the work on Holy Communion and the worship of the Holy Eucharist outside of Mass. It's called Eucharistia Sacramentum. And it was first published in 1973 from the Congregation for then for the Divine Worship. So it's very, very clear, and it gives priests and deacons as ordinary ministers of the Eucharist the possibility, obviously, of celebrating. The priest would celebrate Mass, the deacon could celebrate a communion service, but that it gives the opportunity to conduct a communion service to a deacon because he's an ordinary minister and should be the person who leads it if there is a communion service. So what's the fundamental difference? This is very, very careful. Chris, a communion service is not Mass, and especially when we talk about Sunday. So on Sunday, a communion service does not fulfill one's obligation for Sunday Mass. Now, you, you ask a great question there. What exactly are they? When are they a good option? What they are is the best next thing to Mass if it's impossible. And that is, at least communion could be received. What they are not is a substitute for the Holy Mass or to fulfill my obligation for Sunday. I can tell you, Chris, I tell people, our parishes, except in extraordinary situations, it's not the best thing to be having communion services because for most of our dear people go to daily Mass, they are certainly not impeded. Most people have a car from going to Holy Mass if that's their practice at, of a daily Mass. Sunday is a different matter. So, for example, on a Sunday, let's say, and we have an occasion like this on a Sunday, suddenly a priest had COVID. Well, the deacon celebrated a communion service in the parishes during the times for Mass as an absolute exception. So I'd like to just recommend if you would also go to, uh, let me see if I can find it really quickly here, because there are these other documents which help govern it, which are also more recent. And it would take too long. So if you go, obviously, to Redemptione Sacramentum, that's the instruction from 2004. If you go to Canon Law, 1248, Paragraph 2. If you go to the Directory for Sunday Celebrations in the Absence of a Priest, Congregation for Divine Worship, 1988. And if you also go to, do I have one more? I can't find it at the moment, but I think it's helpful that we see those just fundamental principles, huh? Because obviously the Holy Eucharist is the most important thing that we could do specifically because that's our obligation on a Sunday. Well, thank you, Bishop. Is that helpful? Out of time, could we get a We made it, didn't we, Ron? Yes, we did. Did we get all those questions no, in? No, actually we didn't. Oh, that's my. Okay. That's all right. Next time, Ron. They'll listen, on, they'll listen on the next show. I hope they'll come back. I hope <laughs> they're not too disappointed. Let's pray, folks. This is from the opening prayer uh, from the gospel that we did for Sunday. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, whom taught by the Holy Spirit we dare to call Father, bring, we pray, to perfection in our hearts the spirit of adoption as your sons and daughters, that we may merit to enter into the inheritance which you have promised. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for being with us. We are so deeply grateful that you join us, and it's, it's a joy to have you. Blessings. Thanks for watching and listening, folks. We'll see you again right here next week at the Bishop's Corner.